this afternoon. As we look to expand our workforce, my administration is focused on helping current Vermonters enter the workforce with licensing reciprocity for our service men and women, returnship opportunities for older Vermonters who want to continue working here, access to post-secondary training and retraining, including adult technical education and more. But we also need to attract more young professionals and families to the state. Last week, I was excited to announce a new initiative from our Department of Tourism and Marketing that illustrated how our agencies and departments are thinking outside the box to attract more people to Vermont. This week, I'm pleased to be joined by the Vermont State College's leadership team to announce their own outside the box initiative. For years, I've highlighted the role our colleges and universities can play to help us keep more young people here, with tens of thousands of students attending these schools every year. Vermont State College's Welcome Home program, which Chancellor Spaulding will uh, detail in a moment, is exactly the kind of thing we need to attract former students back to the state. With the second oldest population in the country, and one of the few states expected to see our working age population decline by more than 10% over the next decade, we all must work together to change that trajectory. So I truly appreciate the creativity of the Vermont State Colleges with this initiative. Every little bit can help as we focus on expanding our workforce. Given the scope of challenge, we can leave no st uh, stone unturned when it comes to opportunities to keep and retain more young folks to enter our schools and hopefully stay right here in Vermont after graduation. So with that, I'd like to turn it over now to Chancellor Spaulding to detail their new program. Yep. Thank you very much, Governor. Thank you. Our, we really appreciate your leadership. The Vermont State College's system uh, has a mission statement, and it starts with for the benefit of Vermont, not for the benefit of the institutions or the presidents or the chancellor or even our board of trustees. And I'm glad to have the chair of our board of trustees here with us today, Churchill Hines. But our, our mission is for the benefit of Vermont, and we support the governor's efforts to deal with the demographics that are facing not only Vermont, not only Maine and New Hampshire, but many rural parts of this country by trying to entice people that might have started as Vermonters and left to come home. And that's what this initiative is about. People might be surprised to know that roughly half of the students that are graduating from high school and going on to college go out of state. And the good news is many of them decide to come home. But for those students that actually establish a residency in some other state, when they come home under current policy, they have to re-domicile, re-establish a residency in Vermont for a full year before they qualify for in-state tuition. And what this effort is, is to m make it easier for former Vermonters to come back home and go at the in-state rates without having to spend a year establishing your residency. This fall, I had a communication from a mother in Rutland County whose daughter uh, had gone to high school in Vermont, uh, moved out of state, uh, got married, uh, and then they wanted to come back, the husband and wife, and, and go to, in this case, to Castleton. And um, she was going to have to pay out-of-state tuition for a year, and that was enough to tip the decision to not go to Castleton. And I can tell you, I hear it on a fairly regular basis where people are now established in some other state, want to come back to Vermont, but paying that out-of-state tuition is enough of a differential that prevents them from coming home to Vermont, studying in Vermont, and then hopefully setting up residency and staying there, staying here. So this effort uh, is very simple. It's not by itself going to change the day uh, or the, the future, but small things together and the governor governor i remember in your your budget address you mentioned one of the things we we're going to do is focus on those that have an affinity for vermont those that either were from vermont and left or those that come to college here from out of state and you know that really have a a, a reason to, to 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 love the state as much as we do and we need to make it easier for them so i'm very pleased that our board of trustees uh, agreed with the recommendation that we ought to change our in-state tuition policy so that those students that graduate from Vermont, or graduate from high school as Vermonters. So they don't have to actually graduate from a Vermont high school. They graduate from Vermont, uh, graduate from high school, earn a high school diploma or an equivalency 
from anywhere when they or their parents or guardians were residents can come back and get in-state tuition as long as they set up shop for one day when they enroll. So uh, we're hoping that it will, in a small way, make a difference over time. Uh, we don't anticipate you know, a real run on, uh, on the bank here, that if we could get a dozen or a couple dozen people in the first year or so, that would be a victory and in combination with the other efforts that the governor's put in place, put Vermont in a better position to deal with the demographic challenges that are out there. Um, in the policy, it does uh, read that this is effective for high school students that graduate uh, after graduated or earned a diploma or uh, an equivalency after January 1, 2015. Uh, and the intention there was just that we really don't know who's already in the pipeline going way back. So we wanted to give a little latitude and then going forward over time, it'll be uh, more and more available to, to Vermonters that want to come home. So Governor, uh, we support your efforts. Uh, I might say uh, we also are totally supportive of your initiative to have National Guard members, Vermont Guard members qualify for free tuition. Uh, we uh, support the, the way the, the, the bill is in the House with the University of Vermont and the state colleges. Frankly, we're perfectly happy to have all colleges in Vermont participate in that. Either way, though, you know, that is another effort to try to keep people home in that case. So the Vermont State Colleges are pleased to be participating with that, and we're very happy to support your efforts with our welcome home tuition proposal. I'd love to just turn it over to the chair of our board for a, a little bit, and then we can answer any questions if there are any. I know there are no other hot issues around no, here today. No, so. nothing else going on here. Well, <laughs> it, it, this, this uh, welcome home program does take a partial step towards solving one of the great conundrums of Vermonters. And that is, how do you answer the question, are you a Vermonter? Uh, I can tell people that my mother was almost ready to have me when she moved across the state borders, and they challenged my status as a Vermonter for the last 70-something years because of that. And I can say, I can take you to six cemeteries and show you where my prior six generations are buried here. They say, nope, you're not a Vermonter. But for the purposes of, of, of paying tuition at the Vermont State Colleges now, we've adopted the principle that once a Vermonter, always a Vermonter. If you graduate from high school and you were domiciled in Vermont and you've left the state and you want to come back and start your college education, or if you want to restart your college education or take some graduate courses, you're going to be treated like a Vermonter and we won't ask where were you really born or any of those other questions that they pose when people ask that question at cocktail parties. Are you a Vermonter? We've solved that issue at least for the purposes of the Vermont State Colleges, and I think it's a triple win. It's a win for the Vermonters coming home, it's a win for the state of Vermont, and frankly, it's a win for the Vermont State Colleges too, because we only can fulfill our, our, our mission for the benefit of, of Vermont one student at a time. And the more students we have, the better we, we are at fulfilling that mission. Thank you, Governor, Thank for supporting you very much, us. Church. With that, we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about this initiative. You say you're hoping for a dozen or two in the first year? In the first couple of years. You know, it's really hard to get a, a, a real estimate of what might happen. Uh, we hear on occasion people say, gee, I wanted to come, but I'm not going to pay that differential. So it's uh, presumed that these people would, would not come if not for it? Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, small number, but yeah. you know, over time we're we're going to so it's not we're going to promote it, and, right. and, and uh, uh, you know, it'll 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 be our contribution, okay. and, and and really, it just seems like the right thing to do. And it's not like you're writing off tuition money because you don't think you would have gotten that anyway. No, yeah. What's the difference between a semester of in-state versus out-of-state? It's about five thousand a semester, so it's about ten thousand a year. How are you? Well, we have marketing, uh, marketing and admissions teams on all our, our uh, campuses. We're actually hoping that maybe some of this might make the news. Uh, and uh, you know, when we are out going to college fairs and all the other ways that we talk to students and families, we're going to include this in, in our, our message. Is not in-state tuition at Vermont State Colleges in most instances more expensive than what residents here would be paying for out-of-state tuition in other states? Say it again, so let me just make sure. So isn't in-state tuition for residents in Vermont at state mm. colleges yes. generally higher than what they would be paying to be out-of-state students somewhere else? Uh, I would say that's on occasion, but not, not regularly. And it, it does highlight one of the issues that is starting to confront 
public higher education is the the collapse in the different the difference between out-of-state tuition and in-state tuition, which is another issue you know that uh, Vermont uh, happens to have um, among the highest uh, public college tuitions in the country, uh, and um, you know we need to be as competitive as, as we can. Uh, but you know it's the bigger problem, Pete, is if you know really we're trying to attract out-of-state students to come here, paying out-of-state tuition compared to what they could get in their home states, or even with independence. It starts in the fall? Or? Fall, yeah. Okay. And did you say it was limited to after, what were you saying about January 1st, 2000? Yeah, for, for people that earn their diploma or equivalency after January 1, 2015. So we wanted to go back a few years and say to st st those students come on in, but we didn't want to go back. 30 years. So we figured, okay, we're going to go back a few years and then have it work forward. Mm -hmm. Other than this, how does the role for the fall? Uh, it depends. It, it, it depends. And I know that's hard, but we have, we have four different institutions within the system. Uh, and at some of them, it's looking pretty good. Uh, but it's still early in the process. You know, so it's not too early for people to apply. Uh, but it's early in the season for deposits, and um, at some of them it looks, or, you know, f for example, at a, at a place like Castleton, it looks quite favorable right now, but it's so early in the process, and we've upgraded some of our technology so we can process things faster, so it's hard to know whether the numbers are, are real or just that we're getting people in the door and through the, the process quicker. But, you know, I mean, I would say, as the governor said, just, just I don't. I shouldn't go on too long here because there are other issues. But, no, you can go on as long as you uh, want. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there are 25 percent fewer seniors in high school uh, in 2017 than there were in 2007. 25 percent fewer, uh, and um, you know that is a challenge that uh, rural areas of the country are facing all over, and so are we. Uh, you know what we need to recognize is that. Uh, in order to remain vibrant and vital and accessible for our students, we need to look at what the realities are and make uh, adjustments so that we can continue to provide what students need. Uh, and you know, over the last several years, uh, enrollment has gone down uh, pretty much across the board at, in the state colleges. Uh, some uh, it have uh, leveled off this year. Vermont Technical College had a level, if not a slight, increase. Uh, so it's, it's, it's hard to say it uh, is uniform across the entire system, but, uh, you know, the demographics are, are real. And, you know, then you've also got a situation where on your western border, um, you can go tuition free to any one of the SUNY universities up to 120000 of family income. So there are issues like that that we have to confront. It's, as far as I'm concerned, it, it pr provides opportunities for us to actually uh, think about being creative, and that's partially what this policy is. Uh, Jim, what about um, how much of an actual tuition difference will this new program make for? Well, if somebody, it, it, the, uh, the difference between out of state tuition and in state tuition is about $10,000, maybe $10,500, but rounded to $10,000. So if somebody was going to come in and have to re domicile for a year and pay out of state tuition, it's $10,000. Did you decide that it was we done with and all that? Did you decide that it was time for a new education secretary? Uh, no. Uh, what happened was uh, uh, Rebecca had decided uh, that it was time for her. Uh, this was her decision, and um, we uh, I value uh, what she's given uh, to the state over the last four years. What she's done for our cabinet. I, uh, I, I valued her as a team member, and, uh, and she just decided it was time to move on. What reasons did she give you? Um, she just thought it was best for her uh, to, to leave at this time. Uh, it was a personal decision, and she made it. Did Who you might you choose to succeed her? Uh, well, there's a process for that. Uh, I will uh, be naming an interim secretary, uh, but there's a process with the uh, State Board of Education uh, they will forward names. It's somewhat like the ju judicial nominating uh, procedure. And uh, they will be submitting names, and then I will be doing the interviewing 
and then we'll go from there. How long might that take? It depends on how long, how far they search, and uh, again, it depends on what what their process is. Uh, it's something that they will will conduct themselves. So this could have a huge impact on Act Forty Six. I'm I'm not sure that it will have a huge impact on Act Forty Six. I think that uh, at this point in time, uh, Rebecca was uh, uh, integral in. Uh, in passing Act 46 and implementing Act 46, and it's well on its way. And we have a great team. Uh, she's ha she has a great team behind her at the State, uh, State Board of Education, as well as in uh, the agency itself, and we'll continue along that path. Were you seeing eye to eye with Secretary Holcomb on policy? Um, I, I believe we had a great working relationship. Uh, we've, uh, and again, I, I want to commend her uh, for her last four years and two years, almost the second year with me. And uh, I thought uh, uh, we had a great working relationship. That wasn't quite the question. Were you seeing eye to eye on policy? Um, I believe uh, that she understood my vision, uh, and uh, we were moving forward in that regard, and, and still are. Did she raise objections with you, though, about, say, like your cost containment ideas? Well, we always have discussions about uh, policy, uh, but when we uh, have those conversations, uh, we come out uh, as one voice, and we continue to do that throughout the process. So did she voice objections? I, I would just say that we've always had discussions. I've always been open to having discussions with my cabinet members. I, I believe in a team uh, uh, philosophy uh, where we all get together. We voice uh, our opinions, uh, but at the end of the day, when, when it's all done, uh, we come out with one voice, and we've done that. So do you think she decided it was time to move on because she didn't buy into your policies? I think it was just a personal decision for her. She just had been doing this for four years, and uh, it was time for her uh, to move on uh, to other endeavors and look for other opportunities. Did her decision just surprise you, or did you expect it in any way? Um, I, you know, after being in business for three decades, nothing surprises me anymore. Uh, so. Uh, you expect the unexpected, and uh, it was just uh, a time for her to move on. So under, under Act 46, the, the statewide proposal is for, for any further mergers is due from the Secretary by June 1st. So if you hire somebody, are you concerned that that might be too short of a time period for that person to get up to speed and propose that, that uh, document? Well, again, she has a very strong team mm -hmm. uh, at the Agency of Education, as well as a good board, a state board. Uh, we will continue uh, in that uh, in that regard. So I don't believe that this will slow down the process uh, uh, whatsoever. When did you find out that she was doing it? Um, it was at the end of last week. Have you uh, spoken to the public safety commissioner about whether or not he's looked into the investigation or claims of an arrest? Uh, I have uh, spoken to the commissioner. Uh, there was an investigation, an internal investigation done uh, in 2014 as a result of the complaint brought forth by uh, Brady Tonsing. Uh, and as I understand it, uh, there was nothing uh, after the investigation. They, uh, it was uh, inconclusive. There was nothing there. Uh, so uh, at this point in time, uh, Commissioner Anderson will be releasing a statement and will be answering questions in that regard. Uh, so I'll leave that, uh, the rest of it up to him. But. Uh, but I did speak to him, and it appears there was an internal investigation done. What, you know, what does that entail? Did uh, anyone reach out to authorities in China? I, I don't know the specifics of the investigation. A better question for Commissioner Anderson, and he will be releasing a statement on this. Do you know that that's enough? Well, I don't know. Uh, I, you know what, I, what I'm... Right. I think what I'm looking forward to is, uh, is maybe some more information. I know that... Uh, um, uh, Russell Barr has uh, said that there's information there that he's going to be bringing forth. Uh, if there is credible evidence there, uh, as I'm sure, um, I'm sure Commissioner Anderson will reiterate, we'll, we'll move forward. Uh, so if Russell Barr doesn't provide anything, then you won't actively search other records or other evidence? I, again, I think that uh, we'll, I'll let uh, Commissioner Anderson respond in terms of what's been done already and whether well, that's conclusive. So notwithstanding whatever Russell Barr might do from now forward, are you satisfied the state has done enough to 
settle this matter? Well, again, uh, when I reached out to Commissioner Anderson, he said that an investigation had been done, an internal investigation, and so I, I would have to assume uh, that it was thorough, but I would let him answer that. Uh, it was yeah. thorough, but what was the outcome of that investigation? It, again, it, there was uh, no uh, no evidence of uh, wrongdoing at that point in time uh, that I understand. When would we get the statement? I, I think it's going to be in, within the next few days. Uh, he is uh, he is preparing that as we speak. And it was the same allegation that Russell Farr brought up. Uh, that there was some there was some. Yeah, there, there was some uh, uh, activity in China, yes. And it was as a result of the complaint brought forward by Brady Tonzing in 2014, I believe. Complaint or public records request? I think it was a complaint, but, uh, but maybe, it was a, maybe it was a public records request, but I thought it was a complaint. Um, I, you know, th th this is, uh, from my standpoint, uh, this is my second year now, 14, 15 months into office, uh, I believe. Um, this isn't a retirement. Uh, this is someone that's decided to move on and do something else. Uh, I don't know, so we've had any other secretaries uh, leave, so I don't have anything to base it on. Has she said what she's going to do? Is she leaving us for another I don't. I don't know uh, at at this point. Uh, she didn't mention that to me. So a lot of uh, a lot of folks here today still counting on you to make S fifty five go away, um, and they think a good reason is it might impact some state businesses, particularly particularly related to the magazine, the magazine capacity. Is, right. Um, they're going to be disappointed again. Well, I, here's what I think is uh, happening as we speak. I believe there are negotiations going on in the House right now uh, in terms of uh, trying to do whatever they can uh, to protect uh, businesses in Vermont. And, and I believe that those, um, those uh, uh, conversations are ongoing. Uh, we'll see what the outcome is of that. They'll have the debate on the floor. Amendments will be proposed, and we'll see whether they pass or not. At that point, uh, whether it passes the House uh, uh, then it will, uh, if it does, succeeds, uh, it will go to the, to the Senate at that point. But you haven't found any reason to back away from your sort of conditional support? Well, again, uh, you, you know, my uh, priority, as we uh, staked out uh, last week, was to see the other two bills pass, uh, S-221 and H-422. Uh, that was my priority. Uh, and. Uh, and then, uh, in in regards to uh, S55, uh, this is uh, something. There are many pieces of that bill that I am in agreement with, and uh, so I would hope uh, that they will do whatever they can to make sure that we protect any businesses in Vermont and and make sure that it makes sense uh, to Vermonters. So there are there also pieces that you're not in agreement with? Is that there are pieces that you no, I mean they've highlighted, uh, and this has been an ongoing conversation over the last few days, in particular the the magazine provision, uh, and so I'm I know they're working through it, uh, and I know uh, there will be amendments again being offered this afternoon. So we'll see whether they they pass or they don't. But do you share that concern that those businesses? Well, if they're highlighted, I think many uh, share that concern on both uh, sides of the aisle, uh, as I understand it. So. I'm confident that they will come to some agreement and, and come to some uh, conclusion in terms of an amendment, and then we'll see if uh, the full House will respond to that. But I would have to, to think that they will, they will take a look, and, they, and they're working feverishly on that. So businesses, if businesses are protected, you don't have a problem with the magazine capacity limit? Uh, you know, I staked this out again, I think it was last week, uh, when I made mention of the fact that when some uh, had advocated for an, a ban on assault weapons, that I said that it didn't make much sense to me, uh, that those were just, uh, it was the same caliber as many of the semi-automatic deer rifles we use in the state, 223s or 308s, uh, and uh, it looks aggressive, uh, and it looks, uh, uh, but, but the assault weapon itself is tough to define. So. Uh, the only thing really uh, that was the major difference between the two uh, is the magazine size. So they've, uh, they've uh, came to the conclusion that they, 
wanted a limit on the magazine size. And uh, we've had this spirited conversation, very polarizing on both sides, uh, very emotional. Uh, but I'm proud of both sides uh, for the way they've reacted thus far and the way they treat uh, each other has been, uh, has been admirable. So uh, we'll continue to try and do this for Mott Way, and, uh, and we'll get through this. That's a pretty broad stake-off area, though, for a simple question of whether you support that issue. Um, can you say if you support the concept of limiting magazines? Well, again, it wasn't my highest priority. Uh, my highest priority is the action plan that I, uh, that I issued. Uh, as well as uh, those uh, two bills, uh, S-221 and H-422, those are my highest priorities. I think going from 18 to 21 makes sense with, with uh, the, uh, the provisions that uh, I'd asked for, uh, that being if you're in the, in the military, you can buy at 18. If you're in law enforcement, you can buy at 18. Or if you've had a, a safety course, a certified safety course like I had, an NRA course like I had when I was uh, a youth hunter, then I think that's okay. Uh, you should be able to buy at 18 as well. Those were the, the highest of priorities. The magazine, if it was in there, uh, and, uh, and they, I'm hoping uh, that they will uh, find ways to, to make sure that we protect businesses in the state of Vermont, uh, that, uh, that I would find my way to, to agreeing with that. But we'll see what the details do matter. And, and I, I know I've said that before, but the, those small details matter. And I just want to make sure that we're moving in the right direction. When you say businesses, do you mean specifically manufacturers, or are you also thinking of gun shops? I'm, of I'm thinking <laughs> of manufacturers. Okay. And, and so if you could find your way to supporting that piece, what's the logic behind it uh, in your view? Why, why do you have to pass the magazine's concern? Well, again, a, a thirty-round, uh, thirty-round magazine is much is much different than a ten-round magazine. Uh, it's just, again, when I look at the differences between an assault weapon and a and a uh, semi-automatic deer rifle, the major difference. I mean, there's there's a lot of other appearance issues, but there's a lot of other issues for the suppression and so forth. But the main difference, uh, the caliber is the same. It's just uh, it's just really the magazine size. So. Instead of uh, people trying to uh, find a way to, to ban assault weapons, which I don't agree with, um, the magazine size uh, mean, seems to me to be the difference between the two. But do you think it would make a difference in terms of public safety for, for those higher capacity magazines to be restricted? Well, I, you know, I think there's a big difference between a 30 round clip and a 10 round clip. Well, I don't think anyone would, would disagree that there's a difference, but from, from, from a policy perspective, why make that? Because I think that having a, the capacity of a 30-round clip uh, versus a 10-round clip is drastic. It's it's you know three times the size, uh, so you, you can uh, you can do a lot of damage in, uh, with that extra size. I believe. What do you say to your supporters who may not be too keen on your current stance? Yeah, I, you know I fully appreciate that, uh, and uh, and it's not lost on me uh, that. Uh, that I disappointed uh, many of my supporters. I, I, I understand that. I mean, I was where they were uh, about a month ago before the incident in Fairhaven. So after reading the affidavit and, and seeing uh, that this, uh, we aren't so special here in Vermont, uh, that we aren't insulated uh, from this violence uh, that's uh, seemed to take over our country, uh, that, uh, that I have an obligation. Again, uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous responsibility uh, as governor to make sure that you protect the citizens of the state. So um, this isn't an easy decision for me to make, um, but I have to look at it broadly and, and ask myself, do some soul searching, and ask myself, am I doing, are we doing everything we can to protect our kids? And uh, the answer for me at that point in time was no. Um, so I um, established the action plan. We're taking, we're assessing the schools. Uh, looking forward to that plan uh, coming back, that assessment coming back uh, to me over the next week or so. And then um, with the $5 million worth of school grants, we'll implement that uh, and, uh, and try and do whatever we can, <clears throat> as well as establish the task force uh, that I think will be necessary as we move forward to, to look at how do we make sure our communities, how do we make sure our schools are safe. And uh, we'll take uh, additional measures uh, as a result of that. So um, 
you know, I hope um, that they will take the time uh, to, to read the affidavit uh, and to understand that this does not, does not take away their Second Amendment rights. I believe, uh, I'm, I'm a believer in the Second Amendment, I'm a proponent of the Second Amendment, uh, and I don't believe that anything that, uh, that I propose uh, in any way uh, takes away uh, their rights uh, to uh, bear arms. This, uh, being governor is a tough job, but where does this rank, this last month, month and a half, um, in your tenure so far? Well, again, uh, yeah, this is uh, this ranks up uh, in, in one of the top uh, top five, uh, certainly. And uh, any time that you're faced with uh, with something, uh, a, an horrific uh, event that could have taken place, because in my mind, after reading the affidavit, it wasn't a question of if, it was a question of which day. And uh, with uh, with the threat uh, being so real, the plan uh, that. Uh, this uh, young man had, uh, had developed over quite a long period of time uh, that went undetected by, by many, uh, that nobody knew it was happening, but he'd been doing it for months. And, uh, and again, uh, even during the interview, uh, he is saying uh, that uh, this might not happen uh, this week or next month or next year, but it's going to happen. Uh, so he is uh, still planning uh, this out so again, uh, this, uh, this led me to the conclusion that we have to do more. Uh, and, and, and it doesn't stop. It's not just about guns. Uh, this is about, uh, about uh, the underlying violence. And we're going to have to work at this. This isn't, uh, uh, there's no single answer to this. Uh, but we have to channel uh, this energy uh, to, to take a look at what the root of the violence is. I think we all have a role to play. Even, uh, our youth uh, who have been so active uh, in, in this, and I applaud them for that. But I would like them to, to turn this uh, energy into construction as well. Uh, they can do more in terms of how they treat each other. How do they treat each other in schools? How do we treat each other on social media? I mean, we all have a role to play in this. So uh, I think this is a teaching moment for us as a state, uh, us as a country, uh, and we should take advantage of it. <coughs> I haven't checked, uh, to be honest. I think. Um, How many magazines do these guys open? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I I'll have to check. I, I don't know. Maybe in, in I'm thinking in uh, one of my pistols, maybe. And do you have any concerns if, if you do have one, if it would be difficult to enforce? What was well again? The th just, just remember, as proposed. Uh, as proposed, and who knows what the end result will be, uh, but this isn't taking anyone's magazines away. Uh, you are able to keep the magazines you own. So it doesn't take anything away from anyone. It, it precludes you from buying or selling in the state. Earlier today, there were some uh, off-duty law enforcement officers, many of whom were here as private citizens. Some were in uniform, speaking out against the spill. Do you have any thoughts on that, sir? Um, I have not spoken to them. Uh, in terms of this particular bill, uh, I have sat down with uh, some law enforcement in terms of uh, S221 and H422, uh, but I don't know if they were advocating for, I, I don't know what the results of that one, whether it was this bill, um, S55. Correct. Yeah, I, yeah, I, they, uh, they hadn't brought up anything. When I was meeting with them, they, they hadn't brought up anything about that bill. Now, do you have any concerns about um, the federal government asking people about their citizenship on the census? Um, some people have been concerned about that, and, uh, that it might lead to undercounting of, of undocumented populations or other people who are more cautious about being asked about their citizenship. Yeah, uh, obviously I'm concerned uh, whenever there's a registry of any sort, and I would include uh, guns along with that. Uh, when we were we pass uh, S79, we spoke a lot about. Uh, uh, a registry of some sort and our concerns about that and we want to protect uh, ourselves from that uh, and I mentioned during that time not just uh, that my concerns aren't just about the the fourth or the tenth amendment they're about the second amendment too so uh, we've uh, we've taken steps uh, here in the state to prevent that from happening but I'm uh, obviously uh, anytime we have registries of any sort I'm concerned 
I'm sorry? Have you had a chance to read Estes? I did. I did. Uh, I still have the same conclusion. It is directing a fee. I think it's an overreach by the legislature <laughs> in that regard. Uh, they uh, not only it wants you to come up with a, per, a parcel fee of some sort and then implement it. I think if they want to, uh, if they want to move in that direction, just come up with a parcel fee themselves, and and uh, you don't have to direct me to do it. Uh, you can you can pass legislation that will accomplish the same thing. Do you think the legislature should be weighing in on telling a developer in Utah not to build in the upper valley? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that came up uh, quite a few months ago, maybe a year ago. Um, I think it's uh, I, th I think it's it's a real delicate balance. I, I don't believe you, you should be t telling someone uh, that they can't uh, come here uh, to the state, regardless of what their their plans are. Um, at the at the same time, I don't know if uh, if uh, the gentleman from Utah has been through our permit process, but it'll take some time for him to get through uh, in that in that regard. You don't personally oppose the idea at this point no I mean let's see what he's pre I mean it's an idea he has so let's see let's see where he goes with it governor do you have uh, any recommendations for the legislature you've been really clear you don't want to see a property tax increase or a property income tax shift no taxes or fees right um, but do you have um, ideas of how the legislature can meet that demand at this point yeah, I think there's uh, there's many ways. Uh, as I said, if you can uh, if you can show me uh, where you're, uh, there's some cost containment in terms of education, um, we will uh, find ways uh, to buy that down and uh, make sure that we don't raise taxes as a result. I'm concerned about uh, some like their budget bill, which was uh, close, uh, but they they still use about four million dollars of the thirty million dollars that I'd like to give back. Uh, that was. Uh, uh, an inadvertent uh, um, uh, action due to the federal tax uh, law change uh, that we're collecting $30 million more. I'd like to give it back before we spend it, uh, but unfortunately in, it appears uh, that uh, they've taken $4 million of that uh, to use it to, uh, to support their budget. So I'm still uh, very concerned about, uh, about our uh, ability uh, in terms of affordability in this state, and uh, and I believe that there are ways that we can we can come to conclusion. Uh, but we're going to uh, I'd like to see some cost containment ideas, like the as I said last week, uh, the state uh, health care contract. I think is uh, one approach that we could take. Uh, this uh, V High Commission that we came up with, and and uh, and as a result, uh, they have uh, said they thought it was a good idea as well. So uh, let's uh, let's implement that. Uh, Do you that have an estimate of what that was? Well, last year it was twenty six million. Uh, I don't know what it'll be. Uh, I I don't know what it'd be at this point in time. But let's just say it's around that. And beyond that, do you have other ideas? Well, there's special ed uh, that they've been working on uh, some. Uh, let's put a price tag on that. Where you know when can we save the money? When and where and how? Yes, they've raised concerns about running afoul. Okay. The Burlington City Council last night voted nine to three to ask the Air Force uh, to substitute different airplanes. Do you have any conversations uh, today uh, on that issue? Uh, the mayor hasn't been clear on what he's going to do, uh, but uh, so this is what that could proceed. Yeah, I haven't had any conversations with the mayor on this issue today or uh, over the last uh, week or so. Uh, but what would you advise them to do? Um, I know what we as a state uh, will do. Uh, we're going to uh, welcome the F-35 to Vermont, look forward to it coming to Vermont. I think this is a, a good economic tool for us, and uh, we're very fortunate to have them based here. So we should, should we ignore the vote? Well, I, I don't think they're ignoring the vote. Um, they uh, uh, they are uh, sending a letter, uh, I believe, uh, that's what I read, uh, that they were going to be sending a letter uh, to the Secretary of the Air Force uh, in, this, uh, in this regard. So they should 
continue to do that. I'll continue to advocate for the F-35. Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming in.